one where actually having a, a webinar on a vaccine, which is incredibly exciting and quite extraordinary given where we were a year ago. Um, so I know a lot of you have had many, many questions um, about the safety and the speed of the rollout and, and all sorts of other things. So we've, we've put together this presentation today just to answer a lot of those questions, hopefully, um, and to reassure some of you if you're feeling a little bit hesitant about having it, um, but also just sort of wondering what what's potentially going to happen next. So hopefully the next slides will make things a little bit clearer. And at the end, I'll have a, a link to all of the, the websites where we've, we've gathered the information from um, for, the, for the session today. So probably the first thing most people are a bit anxious about or hesitant about is that the vaccine has obviously um, come out at extraordinary speed. Um, so I think for those of you that have been involved in clinical trials or research in any way, the normal process is painstakingly slow. So um, this, is, this is quite an unusual situation. So you're, you're probably quite right to be um, a little bit hesitant or anxious about that. Um, I think there's, there's a few very key differences, big differences to, to the COVID vaccine trials. And the first thing is that this has obviously been something that the entire world has been focused on to, to achieve. So um, most other research has been halted and everyone has been focused on COVID-19 vaccine trials. Um, so there is that very real international collaboration in, in the research which has sped things along. Um, secondly is the sort of investment in terms of finances for the vaccine trials. Money has been thrown at this like no other um, clinical trial ever, I think. Um, and the other issue is recruitment. Quite often that's something that slows down clinical trials, but clearly with the entire world focused on recruiting for these vaccine trials, that hasn't, that hasn't been an issue. Um, in terms of the stages of, of the clinical trials, these have all taken place as they would for any other uh, clinical trial, the three stages. None of those stages have been bypassed or, or sped through. Um, one of the key differences is that um, they've, been, they've been run in parallel. So once the safety um, of these vaccines was established, um, the different stages were then run in, in parallel. So that has sped up the vaccine the trial process enormously. Um, the other key difference is that uh, the companies producing these vaccines started large scale production of them while the trials were still in progress so that they would actually be ready to go with, with distributing once the, uh, the safety and efficacy had been established. The other key question clearly is, are the vaccines safe? So uh, I think, as I've just said, all of the, the normal stages of, of the trial have, have passed through as they normally would. Um, so the MHRA, which is the UK uh, medicines regulator, has approved all of the vaccines that we're currently offering in the UK. Um, and I think you know, we should be reassured that the MHRA has the highest safety standards in the world. And often um, most other countries will look to the UK for, for how they've responded to something for, for reassurance on that. Um, the MHRA has obviously considered these license applications very, very quickly because of the pressing need. Um, in terms of loss of life in this country and, um, and the very widespread transmission of the virus. Um, the, the other key thing is that the Pfizer vaccine was sharing the trial data um, as it was received. So it was, it was a rolling review with the MHRA. So that sped up things enormously and that really put the UK in a position to be, to be the first ones actually to, to approve these vaccines because we didn't have all the data to, to go through at the end of the trials. It was, it was being done as it happened, as it were. So in terms of side effects, um, I think you've probably all read some potentially disturbing things in social media. People have spoken anecdotally about side effects. Um, I think the, the real experience is that for the majority of people, they will have either no side effects or very mild sort of like symptoms which you would commonly experience with any vaccine. Um, so these sorts of symptoms are headache, a bit of arm pain where somebody's stabbed a very sharp needle into a muscle, um, perhaps a fever lasting a couple of days, 
really just very mild symptoms. That's just a sign that your immune system is, is kicking in. Um, just an important point is if you have a fever that occurs sort of longer than a couple of days after your vaccination um, or any other symptoms consistent with COVID-19, so loss of taste or smell um, or a cough, obviously you should uh, stay at home and arrange to get a test. Um, so the, the vaccine doesn't offer you immediate protection. So it's very possible still that you could have the vaccine and still contract the virus within the next two or three weeks and develop symptoms. So if you have that fever beyond that period, um, you, you do need to get tested. Um, we know a lot about the side effects because there is a, a consistent reporting mechanism for people to, to submit those details. And that information is given to you when you, when you have your vaccine. Um, so in this sense, we have ongoing um, data being accumulated about the side effects for these vaccines. Um, so a lot of people are concerned about the lack of long term data. Obviously, that's impossible at this stage. Um, and it may be that as time goes on, we may develop more information on extremely rare side effects. Um, but clearly, we've now vaccinated millions of people um, you know, across the world. And so that body of, of information is, is constantly growing and is already quite robust. Um, I think an important point to make is that regardless of how rare those side effects are, we know the very real side effects of COVID. And um, I can see that the, the ABN, the Association of British Neurologists, um, have put out a statement saying that, you know, it's uh, the risks with the vaccine will be much rarer than, than the very real risks and known risks of COVID-19 infection um, and its serious complications. So how do the COVID-19 vaccines work? Um, so there are two very different techniques, but they both generate an immune response targeting this um, viral protein spike, which you've probably heard about in the media, which essentially is the key um, for the virus to enter into the host cells. So um, the vaccines that are on offer in the UK um, all stimulate the immune system to make antibodies and cells to fight infection. Uh, so it's important to point out that none of the vaccines are a live vaccine, um, i.e. it doesn't contain a version of the virus or the bacteria they prevent. So it's absolutely impossible to catch coronavirus from the vaccine. So I know that's something some people are very concerned about, but um, they are not live vaccines. So the messenger RNA vaccines use the, the genetic code. So the two vaccines that use this process are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, they don't contain any pieces of the actual coronavirus. Um, so they do contain part of the genetic code of the virus, which is carried by the messenger RNA. And these vaccines work by injecting this part of the genetic code, which trains the body's immune system um, to attack the coronavirus if it's exposed to it. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but at the end of the slides, I'll, I'll have the links to both the uh, Pfizer and Moderna websites, which go into that, that process in a little bit more detail. The Oxford vaccine is a viral vector vaccine, um, which uses a weak version of the virus that causes the common cold in chimpanzees. And this uh, is the vehicle that um, uh, helps it get into the body like an actual virus would. Um, so in this vaccine, the virus has had its genetic code changed, so it can't actually cause disease in humans. Um, the change also means it's got the genetic code for that particular part of the coronavirus, the spike protein, um, the spike on the outside of the virus that it uses to get inside our cells. Um, so the vaccine makes the same spike, so our immune system can recognise it if the actual coronavirus gets in and then, and then fight it off. So there, you may have read uh, things on the media and in, in the news uh, and uh, various social, social media sites about what the coronavirus vaccines contain. Um, and I think it's important to say that this information is very available to the public, um, both on the, uh, the vaccine company's websites and the government website has um, the full list of, of the components of those vaccines. Um, so there's nothing yeah. secretive or hidden about that. Um, the, the, the people that shouldn't have the vaccine are anyone who's had any sort of severe allergic reaction to any of the components of the vaccine. 
um, or have experienced uh, an anaphylactic reaction after the first dose, and you'll definitely know about that if that's you. Um, we've had a lot of people emailing us and calling us asking if they should have it. They've had a reaction to this drug or that drug. Um, I think the best thing to do really is, is to discuss that with your GP who should have your full medical history and the details of any um, drug reactions you've had and the severity of those reactions um, and the type of vaccine that you're going to be offered to, to check the list of components for that. So how effective is the coronavirus vaccine and is protection instant? Um, so the short answer is they're all very effective. Um, so they've passed all of those stages in terms of efficacy and safety. And we can be very confident that, that the vaccines that we have approved in this country are, are very effective. Um, as with any vaccine, it, it does take time for you to build up your response to the virus. Um, in general, the older you are, the longer it will take. Uh, so the general guidance is that in younger people, it probably takes around two weeks um, and at least three weeks in older people before you can expect to get a good antibody response. Um, so the first dose will give you very good protection, but you do still need to have that second dose to give you the best protection. So it's really important, um, even after you've had that first one, to continue to protect yourself and protect others from catching or, or spreading the virus. So the UK obviously took this quite controversial, um, at the time, decision to postpone the second dose. Um, so this was a decision the UK's chief medical officers um, took based on really the, the situation in this country where we had very high levels of um, transmission of the virus and a very high, high death rate. Um, and they looked at the evidence and agreed that one dose offers a very high level of protection after a couple of weeks. So 89% for the Pfizer vaccine and 74% for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So they took this decision really to allow the maximum benefit for the most number of people in the shortest amount of time to help save lives. Um, so you may see that other countries are doing slightly different things um, based on their own individual situations. So I think France has taken the decision to only offer one vaccine to people who have a documented um, COVID infection already on the basis that they, they may already have some level of immunity. And they're, I think, essentially treating that one dose as the booster vaccine. Um, so in this country, we've, we've done extremely well to get the vaccine to a very, very large number of people. And, and we're hopeful that that has, you know, we're starting to have a significant impact on not only the transmission, but, but the death rates that we're seeing in this country. Um, but just to repeat that it is, it is really important for, for everyone to get that second dose. So when you are offered, do make sure you, you attend for that. Something we get asked a lot is, uh, is one vaccine better than the other? And will I get a choice in, in the vaccine that I get? Um, so there have been no head-to-head -head trials um, looking at the different vaccines. And so I think the short answer is they're all very, very effective. And we would encourage you to take whichever vaccine you are offered. Um, at the moment, there are three vaccines approved in the UK. The Pfizer vaccine was approved first. Um, the Oxford uh, vaccine was approved next, and the Moderna vaccine has been approved as well. That isn't expected to be rolled out, I don't think, until um, sort of late spring. Uh, I believe the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be the fourth, and um, I think the, the MHRA are, are in the process of, of approving that at the moment, though I don't think there are any dates on when that's expected. Um, I believe the UK has purchased um, millions of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but um, from what I've, I've read, that's not expected to take delivery until sort of the, the latter part of the year. Uh, all of these drugs, uh, vaccines, as I said, have, have met strict safety standards and um, efficacy by the MHRA. Uh, so you won't be able to choose which one you get. I think the only caveat to that is people who have um, a vaccine, maybe uh, allergy may be offered uh, an alternative vaccine if, if that's possible. Uh, and I think the, the, you know, the research information that we have already confirms that the best way to stay out of hospital with COVID-19 is to get 
any of those vaccines that you're offered. Uh, so what does percentage of efficacy actually mean? So we've seen these, um, these percentages thrown about in the media, and I think one common misunderstanding is that um, 95% efficacy means that in the clinical trial, 5% of vaccinated people got COVID, and that's, that's absolutely not true. Um, the actual percentage of vaccinated people in the trials who got COVID-19 was about 100 times less than that, at about 0.04%. Um, so what that percentage actually means, 95%, is that vaccinated people have a 95% lower risk of getting COVID-19 compared with the control group participants who weren't vaccinated. Um, so in other words, the vaccinated people in the Pfizer clinical trial, for example, were 20 times less likely than the control group to get COVID-19. Um, so just to put that into context with other, other vaccines that, that we offer, um, the MMR vaccine, the measles, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is 97% effective, I believe, against measles and 88% um, effective against mumps. Um, the BCG is 50%. So if you look at it in the context of other vaccines that we uh, happily offer currently um, on the NHS, this actually makes the COVID-19 vaccine one of the most effective vaccines essentially that we currently offer. So how long does the vaccine uh, protection last? Um, and is there a need for a booster vaccine on a regular basis? Uh, I think this is something that we don't know yet clearly. Um, over time, as we get more information um, on how, how this uh, works in terms of protection, we'll be able to give better advice about that. I think theoretically, um, from what I've read, the expectation is it will work for at least a year, if not longer. Um, and the volunteers who've been involved in the clinical trials from the beginning are continuing to be monitored. Um, so obviously we'll, we'll have more information being updated about that. So there are no current formal plans in place to provide booster vaccines, but no doubt um, that information will be updated over time. We've been asked by a lot of people whether the COVID-19 vaccines will interfere with any other medications. So for some of you on acetazolamide, et cetera, I've had quite a few people emailing me asking whether um, it's appropriate to have the vaccine. The, the clinical trials weren't actually studying interactions with any other medications. So we don't have any, any formal um, evidence for that. But I think what we can say is that most medicines do not affect your ability to receive vaccines. Um, so the advice that we're giving is that that shouldn't be a contraindication, no matter what medication you're taking. Um, the only um, exception to that is if you're taking an anticoagulant um, a blood thinning drug such as warfarin. Um, but I'm sure your GP will be talking to you about that if you are on warfarin. And it may be that you need to have um, additional monitoring or, or dosage changes uh, around the time of your vaccine. But that's something definitely to discuss with your GP. For people who are immunosuppressed, which um, is probably a very, very small number of people in the ataxia community, um, there are concerns about whether it's safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I think what we would say is that it's safe for people. We're just not entirely sure how effective it is in this group of people. Um, so obviously, if your immune system isn't isn't up to speed, then it may be that you may not have as an effective response with the vaccine. Um, so that is something that we will hopefully get more information as more and more people do, do have, the, have the vaccines. Um, but it may be that this group of people might be asked to continue to take um, those protective measures that we've all been taking for the last year for a little bit longer. So things like social distancing and mask wearing, it may be for that group of people, they might be asked to, to carry on with that a little bit longer. But that's something that I think that will be updated in, in, in the days ahead. I think we were on. Sorry, did you? I think we missed that. Just if you want to start this slide. Oh, this, slide. this slide again. Um, so, for people who are pregnant or thinking about falling pregnant, which I've had quite a lot of, of questions about this, um, the clinical trials that have been uh, undertaken already didn't include pregnant women in them. So, 
for this reason, um, the current recommendation is that if you're pregnant, you should not receive the vaccine. Um, that's not because we think it will be dangerous, but rather that we don't have any evidence to, to ensure its safety. Um, there are a couple of caveats to that, that if you are at very high risk of catching COVID-19, for example, if you're a frontline health or social care worker, um, it may be that it, it makes sense for you to have that vaccine because your risk is that much higher. Um, the other group of people are um, people in the clinically extremely vulnerable category. So for our patient group, that would be somebody with ataxia plus cardiomyopathy, for example, that would make you more, ex more vulnerable to extreme um, severe infection with COVID. Um, for those people, the, uh, the risks of infection probably outweigh um, any theoretical risks with the vaccine. Um, the government, um, the Joint Committee for Vaccines and um, a couple of other professional bodies, so the British Fertility Society, um, I think the Royal College of um, Gynaecologists um, have also put out a couple of statements um, basically reassuring people that if you're of reproductive age, you should have the vaccination when you receive your invitation, um, so include, including those people who are, who are trying to conceive. Um, they're advising that if you fall pregnant between the first and second dose, you're advised to delay that second dose. Um, that's simply because, as I said, we haven't got the clinical trial information on, on the safety with that. Um, the other question we get asked a lot is about whether the vaccines affect fertility. Um, and again, the JCVI and um, those professional bodies have also advised that there's no evidence or theoretical reason um, for the vaccine to affect either male or female fertility. Um, I believe clinical trials have started in pregnant women and um, I believe a very large number of women in America and, and the UK have inadvertently discovered they're pregnant after having the vaccine or immediately beforehand. And I, I think clearly that's, um, that, that, that information will, will keep growing as, as we get more people who, who are pregnant and have the vaccine. If you've had COVID-19, um, can you have the vaccine? Um, so the answer to that is yes, um, but you should wait around four weeks after you've had symptoms or four weeks since your positive test if you didn't have any symptoms um, and until you've, you've recovered from your infection before having the vaccine. Uh, the, the clinical trials focused on people who haven't been exposed to the virus. However, the MHRA have, um, have said that getting vaccinated is just as important people, for people who've had COVID-19 um, as it is for people who haven't, and that's because we're not really sure of, of the immunity that people have after having infection. Um, if you have symptoms that could be COVID-19, you obviously should get a test and not get your vaccine until your period of self-isolation has ended or you've had that four weeks after symptoms. Can you have the vaccine if you're experiencing symptoms of long COVID? Uh, there isn't any evidence to suggest that uh, the vaccine will make those symptoms worse and it's certainly not um, documented anywhere that that's contraindicated. Um, if you've had a confirmed case of COVID-19, you should still have the vaccine when you're invited to do so. I think that's the, the main take home message. Um, although it's hoped that people who've had the virus will have some level of immunity, um, as I said, we, we still aren't quite sure how long that lasts um, and it's certainly not guaranteed. Uh, there have been cases of people um, getting COVID-19 twice within a reasonably short time period. When you're joining a Zoom meeting, you'll see a video preview pop up that prompts you to determine whether you'd like to join the meeting with your video enabled or disabled by default. Simply select the option to join into the meeting using the preference you've selected. Joining and configuring your audio and video within a Zoom meeting is quick and easy. If you see the join audio icon in the bottom left hand corner of your zoom meeting window toolbar, simply select the icon and select join with computer. Sorry, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Intermission. Um, where was I? Uh, can children get the vaccine? Um, so I'm sure you're probably all. No, do you mind um, going through the slides? The previous slides because there was um, massive interference we couldn't follow. Okay. Sorry sure. about that. Thank you. Um, 
the long COVID slide, is that where you want? Okay. Um, so in terms of, of long COVID, um, there's no evidence to suggest the vaccine will, um, will make those symptoms worse and that you shouldn't have the vaccine. Um, you should still have the vaccine when you're offered it. So I think that's the, the main message from that slide. Uh, can children get the vaccine? At this stage, um, the data is only from clinical trials in adults. Um, so we're only offering the vaccine to adults at the moment. Um, children who are 16 plus will be offered it with group four if they're clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, so that's um, people with ataxia and those additional comorbidities like uh, cardiomyopathy or diabetes, et cetera. Um, 16 plus with clinical vulnerabilities um, will be vaccinated with priority group six. Um, so that's essentially anyone with ataxia um, who we would classify as vulnerable. There are children's vaccine trials, I believe, in process at the moment. I think the Pfizer and Moderna um, have completed enrollment uh, for uh, 12 to 16 year olds in a trial. And I think it's expected that that data will uh, be available by the summer. So it may be that those, uh, those vaccines will be, will be offered to children a little bit later on in the year. I think the Oxford AstraZeneca um, is starting to enrol for trials um, currently, but I think that's still very early stages. Uh, I think the important thing to, to really focus on is that age is by far the most important factor um, in terms of your risk. Um, so we know that very few children develop severe symptoms, even if they have an underlying health condition. Um, so even though children aren't currently being offered the vaccine, I think be reassured that you know that is the basis for it. Is that you know we need to offer the vaccine to the people who are who are most at risk um, in the rollout first. Uh, so at the moment um, we are we are working through the list. Um, so the uh, the UK government is aiming to have everybody in the top nine priority groups. Uh, to be vaccinated by the end of April, I believe, um, and everyone over the age of 18 by the end of July. Um, so at the moment, I think we're sort of up to around group six and seven. Uh, so most people with ataxia will be in group six, um, based purely on having an underlying condition which puts them at, at slightly higher risk of, of more severe COVID. Um, people with ataxia plus other comorbidities would be in the extremely vulnerable category. And these are the people who were asked to shield back in March. Um, those people should have been offered the vaccine in, in group four. Um, of course, you may have been offered it earlier based on your age, um, et cetera. Uh, so this is an order which is um, uh, decided by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. And I said it's based on, on your level of risk in terms of, of COVID-19 for severe illness. Um, and I think the, the ATEXIA UK website has a, a statement by the Medical Advisory Panel, um, which really strongly encourages uh, people with ATEXIA to have that vaccine when they're invited to do so. So in England, if you're in any of the top six priority groups, you should already have been invited. If you haven't, um, the government is encouraging you to either call 119 or book online uh, with the NHS to, to get that vaccination. Scotland and Wales, I think, aren't quite at the same point. Um, but again, just visit the NHS um, websites in those, in those regions to book if you haven't received it in those top priority groups. Um, so we're now, as I said, um, in groups six and seven in England. Um, so this includes people with ataxia who've not yet been called up in the earlier priority groups um, and their carers. Um, but just to say, when you get the vaccine is depend on, on quite a lot of factors. So the amount of people in your local area who fall into the higher priority groups um, will kind of affect how quickly you're working through those groups. So for example, if you live in an area where there are a lot of 80 year olds, it's going to take a lot longer to get to those lower groups. So just that might explain why some areas seem to be at slightly different stages of the rollout. Uh, will my partner or carer be eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine? Um, so they are. If you're the main carer for someone, you're now in group six of the rollout. So that's alongside people aged 16 to 64 who have underlying health conditions. 
Um, so the UK government website says that this applies if you're in receipt of a carer's allowance or you are the main carer of an elderly or disabled person whose welfare may be at risk if the carer falls ill. Um, so if you are a carer and you, you haven't been contacted, I think that's probably something to discuss with your GP who, who should know your, you know your personal situation in terms of your caring responsibilities um, if you aren't um, technically registered with a carer's allowance. Um, family members and unpaid carers, of course, might be offered the vaccine earlier based on their age or their own health conditions as well. So who can't get the COVID-19 vaccine? Pretty much everyone can, I think, is, is the, uh, the main message. Um, the only reason you can't have the vaccine is if you've had a severe allergic reaction to any of the components of the vaccine or experience anaphylaxis after the first dose. Um, but just to reassure you that serious allergic reactions are extremely rare and any sort of reaction you are going to have is more likely to happen within minutes of you having the vaccination, uh, which is why when you have it, you are you know, observed for at least 15 minutes to, to half an hour, depending on your age. Um, we've had lots of people emailing asking if they can have the vaccine with this allergic reaction and that reaction. Um, I think, as I said earlier, it's best to speak to your GP who should have your, your full medical history um, of your reaction and, and how severe it was. Um, finally, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and it can be, it can be a little bit difficult to work out um, what is trustworthy. I think it, it's best really to stick to um, government websites or the NHS websites for your information. Um, Embedded in this slide, there's a, a link to a share checklist, which just it's a bit of a useful tool to help you spot false information that you might want to have a look at. Um, and just to point out, the BBC has produced a, a coronavirus vaccine Q&A in multiple languages, which I think um, a lot of the misinformation is, that's being spread is, is really due to kind of difficulties accessing information. So I think that's, that's hugely helpful. And finally, here's a link to all of uh, a slide with all the links to, to where we've, we've got the information for today's slides. Um, so uh, particularly there's information on the um, pregnancy and fertility advice and the JCVI priority groups. Um, there's the links to the vaccine components on the websites, um, as well as all the, the NHS and government links for, for the different parts of the country. That's it. Are there any questions? Oh, lastly. <laughs> Very importantly, <laughs> um, even if you've had the vaccine, it's still really, really important to keep doing all of these things. So we're still social distancing, washing hands, avoiding crowded places, and unfortunately wearing a mask still. Um, I think this is likely to be in place until we have a better idea of, of how the vaccines affect transmission. And you know, it may be that, that that information is updated in the coming days, but for the time being, even if you've had your vaccine, you still need to keep doing these things. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much, Suzanne. That was a really, really clear and useful presentation.